Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to meet you. My pleasure. Glad you came out tonight. Gentlemen, good evening. I'm Alan Palmer. I'm the uh, executive director and the CEO of the National Atomic Testing Museum, the nation's 37th national museum. And that's kind of a nice thing for our state because, uh, you know, the other, the other 36 national museums are Smithsonian's, a couple of, a handful of uh, service museums throughout the United States, and just four privately held museums in the entire country that are homes of national treasures. And this is one of those four, uh, privately held, so we're really uh, proud of that. But there's a message in that. Since it's privately held, it means it's nonprofit. So that's what we count on you to help us out. So thanks for being here tonight to do that. So tonight we've got a very special guest with us. Uh, Stan Friedman uh, is well known for a whole lot of things. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the things that stuck with me about Stan. Uh, he's a real nuclear physicist. And, and that's really something in today's world. There's a lot of accomplishment that goes with that. Uh, Stan started his career by getting his bachelor and his master's degrees uh, in physics from the University of Chicago uh, back in the 50s. That's a little while ago. I'm and proud so, of that. And, and so here he was as, as, as a young student right out of school with a master's degree in physics, right? That's pretty cool. So, but he had to go get a job somewhere. So for the next 14 years, he worked in uh, defense industries and companies such as uh, General Motors, General Electric, uh, Westinghouse, TRW Systems, Aerojet General, and even McDonnell Douglas, uh, where he worked on a whole bunch of programs, including things like uh, nuclear aircraft, uh, fission and fusion rockets, uh, various compact nuclear power plants, uh, and he tells me some of these were successful, but a lot of them were ended up being canceled programs. Is that right, Stan? That's right. Almost all of them were canceled. <laughs> well, but then he, then he, so here he is at a very high level, a nuclear physicist working with some of the greatest corporations in America. And what happens? In 1958, one day, he started liking UFOs. And so it became, for him, kind of a seminal, seminal moment, I think. Uh, and then since that, starting in 1967, he started lecturing around the country. Uh, and he's done that with over 600 colleges, 100 professional groups in uh, 50 U.S. states. Now, the other seven that some people think exist don't count. <laughs> but anyway, so he's, so, so he's authored over 90 different uh, papers uh, on UFOs. He's been a lecturer on TV, on radio, and documentaries. And I think it's safe to say that Stan is probably one of the best known UFO researchers in the country. One of the oldest ones, too. And because it goes back to the 1950s, he, you know, he has that title. So he has, has certainly had a, a view of things related to UFOs that few people have. Uh, most notably was the fact that he was the first civilian researcher uh, at Roswell. And this was, of course, some years after the Roswell incident, but when they picked that up, Stan was one, the first guy on the ground as a civilian investigating Roswell. And since then, he's authored uh, quite a few books, which are available in the back. If you haven't bought one, I encourage you to do it. He is a very prolific author, a great lecturer, and it's a real pleasure to have Stan with us today. So Stan, uh, sir, the lectern is all yours. Nicely done. This isn't the only time in my life when I've juxtaposed UFOs and nuclear, uh, but it's one of the few. And I'm delighted to be here. It's nice to know there's a place that honors the nucleus. I think that's what we're honoring here, aren't we? <laughs> nuclear testing technology. Uh, it's nice not to be swept under the rug. Some people don't want anything to do with anything nuclear, forgetting we're all radioactive. And many of you have had treatments at hospitals that involve the use of radiation. But 
I'm especially pleased to be here because I admire Alan, his courage in taking on what for some people would be an onerous task of trying to justify the existence of anything that honors nuclear stuff. Well, I'm proud to be part of the industry. I should have. <laughs> One of the more interesting lectures, opportunities I had was when I was working for Westinghouse on nuclear rockets. And I was in radiation shielding. And I had a call from a colleague at Los Alamos asking me to speak to the local section of the American Nuclear Society. I said, oh, I'd be delighted. I'd spoken to a number of technical groups. He says, no, I mean on an expense account, Stan. I said, well, I don't make those decisions. <laughs> I was working for Westinghouse in Pittsburgh. He's talking about Los Alamos. I asked my management. They approved. I was officially on an expense account to go from Pittsburgh to Los Alamos to give a lecture entitled Flying the Saucers Are Real. We had over 500 people out, I think the biggest crowd they'd ever had at the time, and there were no negative questions. So it's kind of nice. And here in this town, I spoke to some people who were members of the American Nuclear Society as well. So I'm not a masochist. I am very pleased with the response I get. And in over 700 lectures, I've only had 11 hecklers. <coughs> and two of them were drunk. <laughs> and I'm told that you get more than that if you talk about sports, religion, or politics. <laughs> I don't talk about those things. Anyway. And I'm glad that Alan mentioned that I was not at Roswell in 1947. That was the year I was bar mitzvah. It was my 13th birthday in July of 1947. And I was not in Roswell. I'd never heard of Roswell. <laughs> I've heard a lot about it since. And I guess I have to push the button, don't I? Good idea, Stan. It's part of modern technology, modern journalism, it says here. One of the best uh, PhD theses done about UFOs tells about how rotten a job the journalistic community has done. Uh, there's two examples there. Nobody ever described an alien that looks like that lady with the nice lips, long nose, etc. That's a figment of the imagination. It was the biggest selling issue that year until Princess Diane, incidentally. And popular mechanics didn't get it right either. Uh, but let's go back a little bit. Let me tell you how I got involved. Actually, it was twice. In the mid-70s, I heard a good story from a forest ranger in California. I was living in California about a sighting he'd had and when we finished, he said, you really ought to talk to my mom. She had a great sighting in Albuquerque. His mother was Lydia Sleppy. Called her, talked to her. She had a very good sighting. And somehow it got mentioned that she was working at a radio station that their Roswell affiliate had called and wanted her to take dictation from a guy so they could put it on the newswire because the Roswell station didn't have connection to the newswire. And so he's dictating. She wasn't a journalist. She, she was in accounting, but she was a good typist. And suddenly a bell rings and the machine stops and there's a message that says, discontinue this transmission. And she says to the guy on the other end of the phone, what do I do? He says, stop. Now some people may wonder, why in the heck would that happen? New Mexico had more classified effort going on there than any of the other states. Two of the three nuclear weapons labs were in New Mexico. That's where we were firing to capture German V-2s. That's where the first A-bomb was tested, Trinity site. If there was any place you were going to send spies, New Mexico was a good place, plenty of room to hide them in, one of the least densely populated of all the states. So OK, I talked to Lydia. She gave me some names. This is about 1974. I tracked down some of the people, and I really got nowhere. No, I don't remember that. 
and I'm not sure how much was truth or not, but you can only go so far. So I put it a 